Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Mike Violette is the founder and CEO of Washington Laboratories. He has worked in compliance since 600 megahertz seemed like a high frequency. He's authored numerous articles and publications for and about the industry. And with that, I am gonna go ahead and hand the presentation over to Mike so he can enlighten us with some fundamentals of EMI. Hi, Mike. Thank you very much, Christine. I appreciate the uh, introduction. And I'm gonna start my PowerPoint here. So if everybody can see that, I hope. Can see it, yep. All right, let's get going. So welcome and thank you for attending. Appreciate your time. Really wish we could be uh, you know, in person these days, but I hope everybody's healthy and safe. So this overview is really kind of a fundamentals. I'd like to look at why EMC is an issue. Uh, why do we, how do we predict it? How do we measure it? How do we quantify it? Because it's all about the physics of the situation. As my father used to say, it's physics, it's not black magic. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Talk about some regulations which drive a lot of the EMC issues in our in our in our uh, technology industry and in our daily life, and share some other content. So briefly about us, we've been doing this stuff for over 30 years. We're an EMC wireless environmental product safety, uh, really a few thousands of uh, projects that cut across a lot of the industry, from uh, rockets to robots and and things in between. Meta devices. We've done work on uh, satellite systems, on vehicles, had some fa fa uh, fantastic visits to nuclear power plants in the energy sector. So my, my point about this slide is that EMC cuts across all kinds of industries from the things that you're watching on your on your computer right now, the thing you carry in your pocket and your backpack. Um, so all, a lot of these things are regulatory driven, but a lot of our are, are, are performance driven. So Electromagnetic compatibility. So our fundamentals series this year, I'm going to just do an overview for this particular session. You know, talk about some of the context of the physics that happen in the in the in our electromagnetic world, and then we're going to tee up a couple of more specific uh, focuses on measurements. We'll do another session on radiated emissions for for uh, military commercial types of applications are very similar. Um, there are some specific differences, but we'll, di we'll dig a little bit more into the technology side of that in sessions two, three, and four, with three on conduct emissions and four on immunity testing. And, and the context there is that everything that is sold on the market these days has to comply with these regulations. And the underlying subtext is that they can't interfere with the uh, radio services or try to minimize the interference. And they also have to perform in their in their environment. We'll talk a little bit about the environment in this session. So uh, EMC is electromagnetic compatibility. That's the de definition. So the, uh, the device has to operate in the intended environment without performance degradation and it can't interfere with other systems. We've had uh, several practical measures to this. Once we did some work out in, uh, in uh, Colorado where there was a set of server farms and in the uh, servers were uh, digital devices, you know, great big banks of them, like you see in a data center or something like that. And the emissions from, the, um, from those devices were interfering with cellular reception. And so the, the um, operator of the server farm had to shield the, practically a whole part of the building. And so that's, again, uh, looking at things that are unintentionally sending emissions out that are uh, operating with things that have uh, the right to operate. So we don't want EMI, um, but it's, I'm a little bit um, tortured there because without EMI, I wouldn't have a career. So. So why, why EMI, why EMC, what, what is this? You know, it's all about photons really, because we're all made of photons and photons express a, a packet of information, a packet of energy. And so, as my father says, it's all about fields and waves and, and regulations. And, it, and if you flip over your, your uh, charger for your uh, computer, you'll see a whole bunch of cartoons on there. This is all about labels for uh, different uh, regulatory matters. And so that's, 
A lot of our bag in the Washington labs is testing for these types of compliances to make sure that things uh, operate well and safe. So a couple of these guys uh, figured this stuff out and uh, many others worked on these things. So here's a picture of uh, Albert and here's a picture of Michael. And uh, these uh, gentlemen, along with many others, uh, figured out the underlying physics of, of electromagnetism, which is really what we deal with every day. Uh, I, I, asked, I asked my dad who invented the television. He said, well, many, many people. So there's lots of folks that have had their hands in this that have predicted the science of, of measurements and electromagnetic propagation. And this lady here, Madame Marie Curie, um, she was born in Wa Warsaw and married a Parisian guy. She coined the term radioactivity and was a winner of the first wo woman winner of the Nobel Prize. And she, she won two. And her, her particular studies were in the, the, the nature of the universe and elements. And it always boils down to this. And so she did a lot of experimentation. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, she died because she had uh, too much exposure to radioactivity when she was working in the laboratories. So a lot of people have done this and worked on this. Um, James Clark Maxwell developed Maxwell's equations, which we use without even thinking about it. Um, but they're what they say, a couple partial differential equations that form the foundation of classical electromagnetism, optics, and electric circuits. So everything can be predicted if you understand the physics of what's going on. And we, we do this daily in the lab. <clears throat> so again, this is uh, these are his equations. There's four. There used to be a lot more, but one of his uh, seminal things was to figure out what um, uh, uh, displacement current was. And he said, put these things together and uh, built on the uh, shoulders of a lot of other very smart guys and ladies. So these equations provide a mathematical model for electrical, optical, and in our increasingly complex uh, society, radio technologies, so power generation, electric motors, wireless communications, lenses, and, and much more. And so this is really at the fundamentals of figuring out what EMI is, what EMC is, and how do we approach it when we are trying to either predict it, measure it, or prevent it. So back to Einstein, uh, the easiest equation I can think of is X equals X. That's sort of a non sequitur. That's easy enough. <clears throat> of course, um, a very profound one that we all familiar with is E equals MC squared. And we have uh, Einstein here with an early COVID uh, haircut. Mine looks kind of similar, but maybe a little, a little less great so far. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it's energy is equal to the mass of something times the speed of a light squared. And so the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, is a quite a fast thing. And so if you convert that into energy, we're all sitting in our chairs and we uh, can be equated to a certain amount of energy. So if you say a 220 pound person, which is kind of the range of my weight, contains about uh, 20 times 10 to the 19th joules of energy. That's that's sort of tell, tells you how much uh, your mass is, uh, could be um, uh, equated to. So for example, a 60 watt bulb burns about 60 joules of energy. And these two guys here in the middle, who are my, my teammates, um, they contain about 18 times 10 to the 19th joules if we were to disassociate them. And one turtle power is about one times 10 to the 18th joules. Again, if you were to take that turtle apart and turn it into pure energy, that's about what, it would, what you'd get out of that turtle. So it's really quite amazing because when you look at these fundamentals, you're looking at the different ways of measuring things. And that's what we do as EMC engineers, we measure stuff, we measure currents, we measure electric energy, we measure magnetic fields, we measure electric fields. And a lot of the things that we've been uh, fortunate to work on is, is remote sensing type of things. And so uh, the Hubble the Hubble images, if I'm an Instagram fan of Hubble and I get, a, I get a, a picture a day. And so sensing this energy from far away is, is a part of what we or have been contributing to. Uh, we worked on uh, the cosmic uh, background explorer uh, satellite that flew back in the 80s. My father in particular is working on some of those things. And so understanding the fundamentals of measurement is critical to predicting EMC. 
And we're excited because the James Webb Telescope and some of our associates' work on that is, is going to be flying pretty soon. And the images that will come out will be just ever more amazing. So our fundamentals of measurements, that's what we do. Um, and these images, you know, Earth images from wind, water, and weather, uh, Earth observatory sciences uh, are, are critical for understanding how our planet operates. We uh, worked on a project um, under the Navy, and it had a, uh, a satellite that looked down at the Earth. And because the folks that drive naval vessels need to understand where the currents are going, where the weather's going, where the wind is going, in order to optimize the placement of their of their fleets. So EMC, electromagnetic, they're coupled, they're immutable, they're predictable, puzzling, and sometimes vexing. But it's all science. And so if we look at a fundamental um, uh, sort of a classic piece of equipment, it's we measure stuff with boxes and wires and buttons and knobs and stuff. So there's there's two different classifications of electromagnetic compatibility. We look at radiated and conducted interference. So conducted stuff is anything with a wire and radiated interference or uh, uh, the uh, nature of that is anything that goes through space. So it can be a susceptibility or an emissions issue. And you can have different kinds of uh, noise uh, sources and you can have different kinds of victims. We talk about the classic thing, source, victim, and in the middle is something called the coupling path. So that coupling path can be through space or it can be on a wire, through wires. And that's how a lot of the regulations have been put together to uh, quantify these, these things and also simulate them. And one of the things that uh, really matters to us as EMC people are the ongoing expansion of the internet of things. And we have uh, machine to machine connections, which are these you know, your device or maybe you, you have our delivery systems uh, for Amazon and others, you know, they have uh, pads that uh, can connect to the network to track projects, track uh, the progress of uh, deliveries and so forth. We have something called vehicle to X or V2X, and that means your car is talking to uh, the Internet or more and more. It's becoming more uh, more um, prevalent. And we have uh, 5G and we're moving on to 6G, which means an expansion of the communications things. And there's really EMC throughout all of these systems. And these are the things that we uh, work on. And what's really been remarkable through my uh, years of doing this is uh, the expansion of the wireless um, technologies. And we have two classes of these, licensed and we have unlicensed. So a licensed thing might be your Samsung or your iPhone, whatever you're carrying in your pocket. And that's a licensed device that is, has per specific spectrum that is granted to the carriers. So you can have a connection and uh, you know email or text your, your friends and families over their wireless network, which is a licensed network. And then unlicensed is all around us, Bluetooth types of things, Wi-Fi, everything that might be in your house from your television to your blender. And typically those things are so-called unlicensed, which means you can pick it up at a, at a big box store, bring it home, plug it in, and off you go. So the, the, the differences are is that the license spectrum is protected, which means that if there's a unintentional emitter that is interfering with a licensed piece of equipment, then uh, that unintentional emitter needs to be uh, mitigated because the carriers and others have, have purchased this spectrum. Uh, typically from the regulatory authority in whatever country you're in. And so they have the right to use that. If you have an unlicensed device, uh, not so much. You know, if you if it doesn't work, and we all uh, have experience when our, our wireless network doesn't work because of some reason, um, it's, it's uh, not not in your uh, realm to, to fix that. You, know, you must ex accept that interference. And that's a very common issue that, that can occur. Um, in our homes and in our, in our workplaces. So what's really remarkable is something about 20, 12 billion devices or more have been deployed according to the Wi-Fi Alliance. And that's a remarkable number of products. And three or more billion shipped in 2020. Whoops, got a nine in there, don't need that. And so something called uh, Wi-Fi ubiquity. And so there's more and more of these things. There's more and more contention. 
Um, there are some really exotic ways to uh, mitigate interference. Um, and uh, the, the smart folks that develop these things have uh, really come up with some, some marvelous solutions to that. And uh, along those lines, and this is part of our, our EMC practice, is that these devices have to comply with certain regulations, and make sure that they're not uh, interfering with the licensed services. And the, the really remarkable thing is that there's trillions of devices on the, on the market being used around the planet. But a lot of the digital devices that must comply with these things, there's very few interference complaints. And what I, what I tell our customers is that this is, this is because the regulations are working. And there's two parts of this, is that the regulations required or demanded that designers figure out how to how to minimize interference. And along the way, they had to figure out how to not interfere with themselves. And so there's a whole other spectrum of uh, experts that work in, um, in um, digital communications that uh, look at signal integrity and power integrity. What does that mean? Well, his signal in integrity, you've got a, uh, a device with millions and millions of transistors in there, and all these things have to communicate in order to function well. And so there's a whole set of design rules and uh, simulation techniques that can be used to uh, minimize the amount of uh, collisions and uh, skewing of, of digital signals. And this is all kind of part of our, our, uh, our industry as well. And in my activities, uh, fortunate to be uh, associated with the EMC Society, and EMC and signal integrity, power integrity have been coupled for the last couple of years because people understand that if the thing is working well, it won't, it will be minimize uh, interference to other, other uh, systems. So I had a little paradigm shift. We're talking about Wi-Fi. WeChat is a very popular uh, application, uh, notably in Asia, but uh, around the world. Um, and so I'm flying in a, coming back to uh, the United States after a trip to Beijing and I was able to couple into the Wi-Fi network on the on the uh, United flight I was on, and have a WeChat live conversation with my colleague in Beijing. Now, you know, there was a little bit of quality problems because you're flying at a thousand kilometers per hour, at, you know, forty thousand feet or whatever it is. And uh, but it was remarkable because I could talk to her um, as easy as I'm calling across the United States. So there's all kinds of other parts of EMC that we have to conserve, wearable technologies, including medical device entertainments, things like this. But ultimately we're all kind of connected and there's a bunch of interconnectedness issues um, that uh, you know, drive the EMC requirements. So the internet of things might be boxes, it might be things with gears and screws or electronics. But uh, the Internet of Things may not be physical objects, but they may be virtual objects such as distributed networks. Anyway, all these things are connected through, through uh, EMC. Now you can have the Internet of Cats. I like this case study because um, you can put a little device on your cat and it will communicate with a feeder, a little Bluetooth or low, low power thing, and it'll open up the, the feeder when, uh, when the appointed time. And kind of a, a, a curious example of this is someone who was able to hack into one of these feeders and, and change the programming and um, overfeed or underfeed uh, several thousand dogs and cats. We also have uh, Internet of Drills where there's uh, wireless technologies that can connect your uh, appliances and your tools to the Internet for various uh, sensing activities. And uh, these things, uh, sensor-based is the Internet of IoT, uh, where you can check on the device performance, uh, shock, vibration, temperature, battery charging, all these things. They all can be fed back into a, a manager so they can see how the things are, are progressing. And more and more of these things are being put into the modern vehicles that can connect back to the to the manufacturers so they can see use cases and uh, predict failures they can predict uh, maintenance and they you know uh, may be uncomfortable a little bit but they can always track your performance and, and where you're going and you know in uh, china they have internet of bicycles all these things are connected to the connected to their cell phone app that allows them to rent we have these in the united states now but that really leads to something about the concerns about hacking and security and this 
really comes into uh, part of the EMC world uh, where medical devices now can be connected to uh, the internet and there's a potential for hacking there. And there are regulations now that are coming into the fore about um, making sure that these things are secure and they, they kind of fit in our space too uh, because of these wireless technologies now um, uh, can, be, uh, can be compromised. We do a little bit of that. So anyway, so let's go back to the EMC part of this. Um, natural, we have natural man-made noise. Uh, there's issues with spectrum contention, uh, device density challenges when you're packing more and more things into smaller packages. And we also have to think about the life cycle of, of uh, devices and making sure that the uh, protections, the designs we make can, can um, uh, allow for a long life and not have comprom compromised performance. So we deal a lot with the electromagnetic spectrum and EMI uh, from low frequency to high frequency. Uh, we are working in the 60 and 90 gigahertz range now in the lab where you've seen uh, uh, vehicle radars and other things that are operating there, very high, high frequency, high bandwidth types of communications. Uh, you can get uh, gigahertz of spectrum. Uh, one of our activities is with the Millimeter Wave Co Coalition, which is looking at um, opening up the spectrum up to the uh, terahertz range. So if you think about this, and Christina's intro, we talked about 600 megahertz. Now we're talking about 600 gigahertz and, and higher. So this really a tremendous amount of uh, activity there. I encourage you to check it out because it's going to be, uh, you know, in our lifetimes where we're using these very high bandwidth areas. And this comes down to, you know, controlling the spectrum and regulating the spectrum and the usage. Some fascinating um, areas in uh, remote sensing and, uh, you know, predictive analysis of weather and so forth. So that's, it's part of, it's part of our, our really broad world. So let's just talk about this fundamentals of natural sources of interference. We have lightning, we have uh, static discharges, solar flares, cosmic noise, and these things can go up to the hundreds of megahertz in, um, in uh, frequency. And a lot of the, what we do in the lab is to do testing for this. We've recently done some EMP testing on some devices, which is a uh, simulation. If there was a nuclear burst in the upper atmosphere, if there would be a pulse of energy that can take out take out the equipment and there's a lot of concern in our uh, in our infrastructure and in our communications in our uh, uh, um, electrical grid about something like this happening with a, a bad actor hopefully not but exploding a, a nuclear device that could take out our our critical infrastructure so this this is part of our world too in the in the emi emc world the human sources are I mentioned that before, um, radio transmitters, power systems, uh, ESD, and uh, other digital devices that are around our, our, our population. So again, we have two classes of, 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 uh, of um, phenomena. We have emissions, which is something that's unintentionally coming out or could be intentionally coming out. And then immunity, which is, you know, the uh, uh, susceptibility of equipment to other interferers. And again, as I mentioned before, two phenomena, we have radiated and conducted types of phenomena, either of wires or you have uh, energy that travels through space. And in our world, with, particularly with um, more and more complex and exotic radio modulations, we have a lot of different types of um, things that we measure. You can have pulsed emissions, you can have CW emissions, you can have all kinds of exotic modulations. You might have uh, bursts, which occur over a short period of time, such as lightning. And you have uh, equipment generated noise that might be uh, transient or non-continuous. So we get into measurements here. And some of you on the call might, might recognize some of these boxes. Um, we, uh, we've got a kind of a, a historical cache of these things, which um, as an engineer, I, I just can't throw in the trash, you know, and sometimes we have to pull them out and they fire right up and uh, some of these old designs still still do the trick. So when we get into um, the uh, regulation of this stuff, there's a lot of EMC specifications. There's a reg residential based things, which you might have around your home, commercial or industrial. We got a lot of more medical um, EMC things that are going on just because of the profusion of medical devices. 
We've got a, a class of uh, specifications for military and aerospace. They're very closely related. And then uh, as, as uh, <clears throat> cars get more complicated, we have uh, vehicle EMC specifications. So here's a couple of example standard classes of standards. Uh, CISPR is an international group. It does, uh, it's a French acronym that um, translates to a special committee on radio interference. And so there's different CISPR classes for different equip, um, emissions classes. In the US, we have the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, in the military side, we have the current version of 461G. As I heard from one of my colleagues, uh, H is being developed. Um, so uh, when I started this uh, business, it was 461C. So these these uh, ac these uh, classifications have increasingly uh, been uh, evolving as the equipment has evolved to include more and more phenomena. On the commercial side, DO-160, and uh, on the medical side, there's a, a Food and Drug Administration requires that uh, devices that are have certain classifications must pass emissions and immunity tests. And then around the world, we've got the uh, IEC and uh, European norms, uh, a bunch of those. So there's really dozens and dozens of these specifications. One of the challenges on our side is to keep it up with this stuff so we know exactly what to prescribe when we when we uh, have a test program. So a little bit more detail here, uh, the 61,000 series, um, uh, dash four, dash two, dash three, dash four, the, dash five, dash six, there are all different classifications that simulate um, uh, different types of phenomena. And uh, the, the question always goes, are these, are these sufficient? Well, some of them are probably overkill, frankly. Um, we don't know why we have to do these, but they're all prescribed for certain types of product classes. So these are the types of tests that we get into, and these are the types of levels. Of for example, electrostatic discharge, if you're in a a dry environment in the middle of winter, you might uh, generate five or six or seven or 8,000 volts of, of uh, electricity on your person as you as you stroll through the house. And uh, I think everybody here is, um, has experienced that when they touch a doorknob and, and get a little shock. And, and so there's other different th classifications that uh, simulate um, man-made and, and natural phenomena. Uh, one of the areas that uh, I just mentioned before is this EMP measurement. Um, there's concerns about, again, protecting the power grid. So there are specifications that uh, infrastructure uh, planners and coordinators have to think about in, in order to protect our, our infrastructure. On the mill side, um, there's a bunch of CEs and CSs and REs, which stand for conducted emissions, conductor susceptibility, uh, radiated emissions and radiated susceptibility. And a lot of these go back to the 40s, 50s when uh, the phenomena was started to be recognized when radios and Jeeps and other uh, vehicles and, and other land-based things um, started experiencing some phenomena. And so I might, from my perspective, several of these things probably don't apply to different equipment. Um, because they're kind of antiquated and, and the technology has changed. I, I, I'm, I may hear some objections, but um, there's a lot of things that are kind of historical legacy types of uh, things, um, tests. And one of the things about uh, doing a mill standard program is, is tailoring, you know, to get the right kind of uh, test specification depending on the implementation and the uh, usage of the equipment. Um, so there's a uh, there's something there that uh, needs to be taken care of when you're when you're specifying uh, different mill standard test programs. This is a kind of a table of a, a sort of equivalence um, between the mill standard 461. Oh, I got an E in there, so we're up to G, uh, and the uh, International Electrotechnical Commission uh, standards. And so there there is some some equivalence. It, there is some non-equivalence. Uh, if you're doing a product for a military program, uh, you, you may not be able to transport that those test results over to a commercial commercial and, and vice versa. So there's some some different carve outs you know, because the uh, mill and the and the uh, commercial world are, are, are different uh, placements. So you got to look at the environments and when we work with people that are looking at uh, EMC issues, we always say, where is it going to be? Where is it going to go? How is it going to be used? And uh, maybe that's not always uh, predictable, but 
for a consumer or a commercial type of equipment, you know, you got two different classes. One is a, a residential or light industry, or you may have heavy in industrial types of applications where there might be large motors or some other heavy equipment. And so that so the demands will be more, more uh, <clears throat> precise. And in the mill side, uh, you have different classifications and and the 461 looks at different uh, placements of devices. Again, they, they look at the practicality of doing uh, uh, certain types of measurements. You don't want to over test. If you're sitting there topside on a uh, on a uh, aircraft carrier, you're going to be susceptible, you know, susceptible or exposed to a lot more higher energy radars and other communications gear. If you're in a submarine, you know, you're under underwater. Uh, in, in the in the hull of a ship, there maybe you're not going to have those kinds of threats. So there's you have to thread that needle and understand where that uh, equipment's going to go in order to well well specify it. So on the standards and regulation side, that's that's our that's our 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 bag. Um, we're looking at compatibility and spectrum protection, um, particularly for wireless deployments, which are becoming more and more. Uh, uh, applied across our across our uh, community. The other side of this is for um, health and safety. So we have a lot of wireless equipment, and there's concerns about you know human health. And so ANSI C95 looks at that. And in Europe, they have their own set of requirements. So these are the uh, safety tests you look at primarily for body worn devices, uh, cell phones, things that are close to the close to the body. Um, your laptop computer, you might be looking at one right now, has antennas in there and there's there's certain amount of uh, specifications that you have to uh, comply with when you are certifying a, a radio device in, in many different applications. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, as I mentioned before, regulates uh, safety and they're con increasingly concerned to uh, about wireless devices. And we've done some work with wireless coexistence type of testing, which is a measure of how much can a uh, critical wireless device uh, function in its environment. And in particular, we did some work on an insulin pump. It was a device that's applied to the body and it connects to a, a cell phone type of application. And the concern there is that uh, it's in the environment of other Wi-Fi systems and and cellular systems. And is that critical connection between the the cell phone device that controls the wireless uh, uh, pump, insulin pump, is it going to maintain its connection, and is it going to malfunction in the it's an environment? So there's there's more of these uh, um, applications that are being pushed by the FDA. Also concern about uh, Radio frequency identification devices, such as anti-theft things that pass through when you walk out of a store, you, those tags that are on the on the product uh, communicate back with these RFID things. And so, there's a particular frequency that's used. And so more and more, the uh, Food and Drug Drug Administration is looking at you know, coexistence in for wireless devices in those environments. So we wonder how much do you have to test? And most of the time, the tests are dictated by the test specification. And when you go through EMC testing, you might be in an industrial environment or a military environment. Um, you look at uh, surge voltage, which might be on a power line. And again, it depends on the classification. So these are some of the levels that you might uh, look at when you're going through a test program. So in the United States, uh, we have uh, EMC uh, in North America for uh, Federal Communications Commission and, and ICED in Canada. They have different classifications for different types of devices. On the safety side, which is uh, related to all this stuff because it's in the compliance arena, we have the National Electrical Code and the Occupational so Safety and Health Administration. They, they pretty much regulate safety. On the medical side, we have the Phi 10 k This is again under the FDA. And on the European side, we have a EMC safety and medical device directive and more and more prominent, at least in our world, a radio equipment directive because more and more devices are, are integrating radios. So when you're getting into a test regimen, 
uh, you got to consider the operating modes. What what's the worst case? That's what the that's what the regulators want to see. Are you are you practically testing something that's going to examine how the EMC performance is? And we have different operating conditions, whether it's wireless or non wireless. We have to test the different frequencies and different modulations. More and more, we're finding uh, Bluetooth and other types of Wi-Fi uh, devices are being integrated into more and more products. Uh, we have a, a heavy equipment manufacturer that has a wireless application that uses um, uh, trust-based encoding to make sure that people are not driving off with their tractors. But in the end, when you're getting through uh, the regulatory process, you got to look at uh, proper labeling, more and more what's called co-location which means that you may have more than one radio in a device and this is quite common and so you have to make sure that when you're operating a multi-radio platform is that you've examined uh, the potential interaction with these things not just from an emc point of view but more and more from a safety point of view because there are limits on the amount of energy that can come out of a single device based on how many transmitters are in it and so we have to examine that when we're going through a product approval so lots of uh, appliances are, are smart and smarter and connected to the internet and a lot have a wireless function. So what's interesting about uh, the EMC business, if I can opine a little bit, is that the, the amount of radio transmitters that are being spread out across the many different platforms are creating pretty interesting um, scenarios for product developers. And so we have on a daily basis, look at this uh, to make sure that uh, the regulations are followed. Number one, number two, performance is correct. And number three, there's no health hazard from uh, multi multi radio devices. As I get again, as I mentioned, the regulatory requirements are have sort of have driven a lot of these things, at least in my career, we have FCC. We have the CE marking in the in the EU, European Union. We have something called the UK Conformity Assessed uh, in the UK, and this came out of uh, Brexit. Um, since the beginning of the year, as a transition period for uh, manufacturers to apply the UK CA mark, uh, which is um, pretty much the same technically as a CE marking, and because the uh, UK is not in the European Union anymore. Uh, as of the end of uh, this year, it, you'll have to apply the UKCA mark to your device if you plan to sell, to sell it in the UK. Uh, China has their own regulations, or Japan has their own regulations, and, and as I mentioned before, I said it in Canada. So there's many more and a different, it really depends on what country you're going to. We have uh, many customers that want to sell globally, which is great because the, the technical regulations are quite... Uh, ubiquitous and and quite common across the globe but there's uh, always some little regulatory twist and as i mentioned before rf safety issues uh, are increasingly uh, of concern and have been you know managed uh, over the years um, to uh, minimize the effect of radio frequencies on, on human health and here's a just a short short list of uh, north america or, uh, united states requirements that address the heart rf uh, safety issue if you're putting an electronic device on it, a certification is required typically. Some devices, if you don't have a radio in there, you can have a, apply what's called the Supplier's Declaration of Conformity or SDOC. And this is a tremendous liberalization of uh, the regulations on digital devices since, since I've been doing this, where back in the day, uh, if you had a computer or a keyboard or anything that connected to a computer, you had to go through a form of certification. Modular transmitters are more and more ubiquitous. You can put things on the market quicker. Um, we recommend uh, certified modules. There's, a, there's a, a pretty straightforward way of getting those approved. And more and more devices have more and more labels. As I showed before, that uh, power supply has so many labels in there. And so the regulators are allowing things uh, to be put on displays instead of having a physical label. And this is a, a, a critical thing for a, a lot of folks and um, particularly for global shipments. We recently worked with a, a client that mislabeled 50,000 devices 
with physical paper label, you know, printed labels. And so we had to do a little bit of twists and turns to, to get those things re reclassified. So they didn't have to relabel all the devices. So this was, um, just happened last week. So if you're going into testing, uh, yeah, FCC requires test labs to be accredited for certification, must be recognized by the FCC. Uh, some things are exempt um, when the digital device regulations were initially uh, enacted in the late 70s, uh, certain classes of uh, industry were able to get an exemption for digital devices, and these are listed out here. Motor vehicles, public utilities, industrial, commercial, scientific, but really practically with the way the globalization is, almost every device gets some kind of assessment. Um, because in Europe, there's a uh, very uh, few exemptions except for public safety and, and military type equipment. So what manufacturers have really taken the tack is get just get the testing done. And um, that's uh, that's become a common practice. As I mentioned before, certification for wireless devices, it's kind of a repeat. So the uh, major, major regional requirements for electronic devices in the United States, FCC, product safety, environmental, uh, uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission regulates toys, toy safeties. In Europe, uh, maybe easy is not the right word, but there's, there's really very little certification of most devices because Europe has a, a self-declaration kind of regimen. Uh, Brazil has some complications and then we work with uh, many countries which have mutual recognition arrangements with the United States. Uh, Canada, obviously, there's a, and what this means is that we can test in the United States for uh, foreign approvals. And uh, MRA's uh, regions include uh, EU and now Britain, uh, Japan, we have some with South Korea. There's a bunch of uh, APEC uh, countries that uh, have been uh, signed on to mutual recognition arrangements arrangements. So a quick overview of the markets for, for device approval, approvals are here. Europe CE marking, China has a couple of different regimens for radio approvals and safety. Brazil has their, their own requirements. And in India in particular, uh, the uh, regulations have ramped up quite a bit and there's uh, more of a formal requirement for for places placing devices on in the India market. In Europe, again, self-declaration. Um, there is something called the notified body scheme for certain class of equipment. Um, you know, dangerous stuff like chainsaws and uh, for uh, radio equipment. If there's a, not a harmonized standard, you need to have a what's called a notified body approval. This is a list of the various directives. And if you took a 40,000 foot view of this, what happened is uh, as the EU started to form, um, it used to be called the common market. Uh, now it's the European Union. They wanted to have a, a, a standard set of directives. So trade and tariff issues were, were uh, less complicated. So they came up with this directive scheme that has a broad coverage and under the directives are various standards that you would apply. So this has really opened up things for a lot of uh, global manufacturers because they can apply these directives and, and ship between the, the 28 or so countries in the European Union without additional technical standards, technical barriers. So if you're getting into the testing business, you know, you have to ask about accreditation. So accreditation body is a, uh, a, a typically a private organization, the United States, that has been assessed or blessed by uh, various industry or government um, uh, regulators. And so you have to uh, make sure your accreditation body is, is up to snuff and your uh, test laboratory has the correct uh, standards on their, on their scope of uh, testing. And finally, you know, there's other functional considerations. You're developing a device, not just EMC or, or product acceptability. You know, there's different types of fora, alliances, and uh, protocol standards if you're putting something on the market. And more and more, these things are more ubiquitous. And if you're developing a device that has potentially a wireless function, then uh, these, to achieve these kinds of conformity assessment is that's not very difficult. 
So I'm going to wrap this up here. We're just about 45 minutes into this, and I just want to remind you that uh, we'll be teeing up uh, sessions two to four of this little series and focus a little bit more on the technical side on measurement techniques. So if you're interested, please join us. And uh, for the time being, uh, if uh, Christina, you teed up any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take them. All right. Yeah, um, we got a few questions in. Uh... Let's see the first question. When exactly did EMI testing first become a formal requirement for device manufacturers? Can, can you repeat that please? I'm sorry. Sure. When exactly did EMI testing first become a formal requirement for device manufacturers? 19, well, on the commercial side, I would say it was 1982, 1983 uh, for the U.S. There was a docket 20870, and I was, a, I was a green engineer just out of college, and this was back in the time when the IBM PC started hitting the market, and there were interference complaints that started to grow and started to become noticeable. Um, there's a classic one where there was a point of sale terminal near a uh, airport and it was jamming the air to ground communications. So the commission, FCC in particular, started picking up these uh, complaints and they started formalizing the uh, inter interference requirements. So 83, 84 for in the United States, uh, the mill standards, uh, the earliest one I can remember was published like in 1967. So that, you know, is on the, on the mill side. So over the years, it's changed as the technology has evolved. Okay, interesting. Okay, uh, another question. As you can tell, the number of standards is enormous. How can a junior engineer keep up with it? Well, maybe maybe listen to a senior engineer, I guess, but um, <laughs> to be facetious, it's it's there's a lot, there's a lot. But um, on the U.S. side, uh, the specifications are all public sourced. Um, in Europe, um, a lot are in the wireless area. Um, a lot of the standards, however, are for fee because these standards development. Um, organizations, you know, they, they've got to make, they got to make some money. So it's, um, it's, it's not easy even for us old guys. <laughs> so let's see, since when wireless is active, the band will be occupied by the RF signal. How should EMC be tested while having a wireless module? I'm not sure I understand that. Maybe you broke up a little bit, CK. Okay, um, I'll try again. So since when, when wireless is active, band is occupied by the RF signal and they're asking how would EMC be tested while having a wireless module? The, uh, well, the, the goal is to uh, turn the wireless module on and to measure its interaction with other wireless devices, perhaps if they're co-located. So one thing we look at is uh, harmonics and potential mixing products between the two modules, if they're both active radios. Um, the other part we look at is look at harmonics of the actual transmitter. And th this is not always so easy because, um, um, because it's difficult to, uh, as an integrator, it's difficult to control that module. You may not be able to have it on uh, to do a predictive or a good measurement. So that, that is a little tricky sometimes. And, you know, in the, in the lab, frankly, we do the best we can. If we have a device that's operating normally, we, we look at the potential harmonics from it to make sure that uh, they're within compliance. Um, it's a it's an excellent question we ask ourselves every day whenever we're trying to do uh, testing on an integrated module system. All right. Um, so before I continue, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that um, definitely after this webinar is over, you guys will receive a a link for a playback. 
And also, I'm sure Mike is going to share his slides via PDF. So we'll get you a copy of the presentation. Is that right? Yeah, everybody will get a follow up email with the uh, PDF and with the recording. And um, okay. if that. That's, if that's the end of the question session, uh, I would like to thank you all, and I want to actually be have, safe and um, and hope to. We've got a few more questions actually that come in if, if you have some time. Happy, Let's see. Happy to. Okay. Um, all right. If if I got it right, in the U.S., assessment is only on emissions instead of Europe where emissions and susceptibility are assessed, why is there a difference? Well, uh, for most consumer products, that's correct. Uh, for medical products, there's a, a immunity as well, typically. And the I think the historical reason is that when the directives were published and this EMC stuff started to take some, take some root, the um, the Europeans were concerned about uh, product quality, and so the immunity tests that are performed are really a measure or an index of the quality of the product in its environment. On the U.S. side, the FCC, um, which governs the airwaves, doesn't care about a product quality. I don't. I'm saying that flippantly, but you know they're mostly concerned about regulating the spectrum against interference. So it's not really in their purview there. So there's there's kind of a classical um, um, uh, difference in philosophies, I might say that way. But I, I do want to make sure folks know that on the uh, on the medical side, there's is definitely immunity testing. Right. Okay. Um. Let's see. So will a notified body be needed for both CE? and UK for EN 301-908-13, version 13.1.1, since OJ says it doesn't offer presumption of conformity after the version 11 is withdrawn in October 2021. So will a notified body be needed for both the CE and UK for, I guess, 908-13, version 13, since uh, version 11 is going to be withdrawn in October this year. Oh, you know, I'd have to look at that question. Um, there, as the, your previous um, participant said, there's so many standards. And right. so uh, I, I wouldn't make a presumption there. So it, in, in, in general, though, if you have a harmonized standard, then you don't need, uh, say, a notified body, and a harmonized standard offers presumption of conformity. If if you have a standard that's not harmonized in the official journal, then a notified body is typically needed to be consulted or uh, issue some kind of a certificate. They used to call it an opinion, but in the radio world now, it's a type in the EMC world, it's a type examination certificate. So we, we do a fair amount of work for some antenna manufacturers for vehicles, and there's no harmonized standard that offers this quote unquote presumption of conformity. So we are uh, tasked with um, doing an assessment of the, of the thing. So it, it depends a little bit on timing and application of that standard. It, I'd be happy to um, converse by email or by phone and uh, offer a little bit more guidance there if, uh, if the questioner wants. Okay. So, all right, uh, we got, looks like three more questions. So the first one, is there a specific standard for co-location testing? In the United States, uh, yeah, it's uh, FCC part 15, number one, and that's the primary one. And so when you have co-located equipment, uh, the, the prescription is to turn both radios on and do, do two assessments. One would be if there's uh, harmonics that are generated because of mixing products, and the two uh, radio transmitters could, in theory, uh, generate uh, additional uh, inner harmonics of uh, the sum and differences of those radio signals. 
The other part of the assessment is uh, falls under general requirements for uh, health and safety. And in that case, it's typically a calculation where you figure out what the power is and the gain of each of the uh, radio transmitters and make an assessment that under normal operation, whether the power would exceed what's called the maximum permissible exposure uh, for for things that are not body worn or or uh, mobile or uh, you know used close to the body. In in that case, uh, and this is quite common, um, a, an SAR or specific absorption rate assessment is required, and that requires an actual measurement. Uh, typically, um, a lot a lot of mobile phone manufacturers have to do a lot of SAR testing or SAR testing. Uh, because there are often multiple transmitters in a, in a mobile phone, and those things must be assessed with the uh, devices in their normal operation, uh, but using a SAR measurement. So there's there's two levels. One is interference, making sure there's no uh, mixing of uh, radio products, and the other part is uh, health and safety. Okay. Uh, the next question is kind of a three-parter. So. What is the criteria to use for classifying the operating environment? Um, I'm sorry, Chris, Christina, you're you're breaking up in and out. I apologize. This might be on my end, but okay. Um, this this next question, there's it's kind of a three part question. So the first part of the question asks, what is the criteria to use for classifying the operating environment? Uh, well, I'll take them. I'll take them a piece at a time. Okay. So the criteria for op for an operating environment is where 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 are you selling it? Number one, what are the regulatory requirements? Is it an is it an industrial space? Is it a consumer space? There's uh, on the con on the commercial and consumer side. There's two different criteria, and they call class A and class B environments. So a class A environment might be an industrial plant or an office plant or office environment where there's less likelihood to be. Uh, frankly, it, it it all went down, it all came down to protecting interference uh, to uh, televisions. And if you look at the class A environment versus a class B, which is consumer or home or apartments, the notion is that in a class B environment, you're more likely to be a across a wall from a neighbor that's that's listening to the radio or, or watching television and that's where the the limits were struck many years ago based on uh, close proximity in a class a environment industrial maybe maybe they don't really care too much about watching television of course this this kind of all went away because most people are either you know listening to internet streaming or have cable tv but it's 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 etched in stone. And this is, it's one of the ten commandments. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, uh, the other let's see. the other consideration would be if there was a spe specification placed on the uh, supplier, you know, from a, from a buyer, for example. Okay. So the second part of this question are human safety requirements covered by EMC directive? I think maybe you kind of answered that with the specific absorption rate and so forth for safety requirements. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, there's requirements. Uh, I, I believe you're not so much EMC directive, but there is a safe general safety directive that uh, has um, some mandates for human health uh, for radio products. It's not it's not in the EMC directive. Okay. Um, the third part of this question is LoRa spectrum licensed. No. Okay, I don't even know what is LoRa Spectrum. Do you know? Okay, sir. No, it's not licensed. It's unlicensed. Okay. But it's it's at different frequencies depending on whether you're in North America or Europe. The frequencies are not harmonized there. They're close, but they're not harmonized. The the actual allocations. Okay. So I got one more question here, and uh, uh, it says, "Which items can we ignore 
example, uh, legacy boilerplate stuff that should go away. I'm not really sure. It just says, which items can we ignore? Legacy boilerplate stuff that, that should go away. Well, um, if, you're sell if you're actively selling a product um, in the North America, 90% of the time or more, if you've got a pre um, approval on something, then you can typically continue to sell it unless you modify the product or the standards change. In Europe, not so much. You know, if you put something on the market, you have to comply completely with the existing standards and directives, even if it's not changed. So you have to you have to comply with the existing regulations. Typically, there there may be some carve outs for that. But. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions in the window here. I can I can take a minute and let's see if somebody asks another question. So while in that minute, I'll just uh, let everybody know that the next upcoming webinar, Exploring EMC Basics and Standards, is going to be presented by Rodi and Schwartz. It'll be on April the 8th. It'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you've not already done so, make sure you visit our website and you can register for the webinar if you're interested. So, uh, Okay, Mike, I I think we have come to the end of it. Well, actually, we had a lot of good questions here. I'm, I'm happy to take more. Um, my address, email address is mikev at wll.com. Okay. We also have uh, questions at wll.com. So you can you can use either one of those emails. Mike's inviting you to, to go ahead and email your questions to him. Um, I think that's gonna do it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for your time. It's been interesting learning about this. Good to hear about the history and stuff. So with that, I well, guess I'm appreciate going to appreciate everybody's participation. Take care. Thank you, CK. Sure. On behalf of Washington Labs Academy, I want to thank everybody for their attendance, and I'll go ahead and end the event now. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and most importantly, be safe. All right, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.